American English. American English. American English. Webinar series. Teach and learn. American English. Webinar series. Hello, teachers from around the world. Welcome, everybody, to American English Webinar Series 4, brought to you by the American English team at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. Let's begin Series 4 with a look at this great photo featuring teachers from Bamako in Mali who were participating during Series 3. We love to see teachers learning together, and we hope all of you viewing groups out there will share your webinar photos by emailing them to AmericanEnglishWebinars at YalePrograms.org. We might just feature them in the next webinar. My name is Heather Benucci. I'm part of the American English team, and I'm also known as Moderator Heather. You'll also see moderators Katie and Amy in the chat box to help you during the webinar. We will all be here to assist and support you as you participate today. Here you can see the exciting schedule for this webinar series. Our next webinar, Classroom Strategies for Engaging Young Learners by Lauren Whitaker, will be in two weeks on September 21st. Our webinars are each 60 minutes long. Webinars are often related to a theme found on the American English website. The Teacher's Corner section from that website is shown here and it features resources and lesson ideas related to the month's topic. The theme for September is Teaching Young Learners. The Teacher's Corner's materials can be accessed in two ways, both from the rotating feature bar at the top of the American English homepage, shown with the yellow arrow, or through the English Teaching Resources section at the bottom center of the page, also shown with the yellow arrow at the bottom. Next, let's look at how you're going to participate in the webinars. During these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenters. The way for you to participate is by typing in the chat box as many of you are doing right now. The chat box is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. We might not be able to answer every question during the session as there are often hundreds of teachers participating. However, there is another place to ask questions after the session is over, the Ning Community for Teachers, which we will look at in just a moment. The presenters may also ask you questions in the form of polls. These multiple choice questions will appear on the screen for you to answer. Some people may unfortunately experience technical problems during the webinar. We will let you know if we are having a global technical problem. If you do lose sound, you can follow along with the caption pod at the bottom of the screen if refreshing your internet browser doesn't correct the audio problem. Each webinar consists, excuse me, each webinar series consists of six webinars, and during the series, webinars will take place every other Wednesday. Participants who attend at least four out of six webinars will receive an e-certificate from their regional English language officer or the local U.S. Embassy after the series ends. And to make sure you're eligible for that e-certificate, we're going to ask you to submit your attendance information at the very end of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, you will click on a link that we give you and you will fill out the requested information on a web-based form. And we hope many of you are already familiar with our Ning community. But if you haven't registered yet, please do join this dynamic online group for EFL teachers. It might take up to 72 hours for your registration to be approved, especially at the beginning of a new series. And here on the Ning, you're going to find resources and discussion questions related to each webinar, as well as all of the recordings and featured materials. The Ning is also where you can ask presenters questions after the webinar through the live chat and you can also interact with fellow community members. And finally, before we get started, did you know that you can find an entire series of short videos on English language idioms on the American English YouTube channel? 
These short videos can spice up your classroom instruction and can offer an interesting self-study opportunity for your students. Recently featured idioms include break the ice, which is seen here, being on the same page, and getting up on the wrong side of the bed. Be sure you check out these fun videos using the link shown here. And now for today's webinar, the role of humor and language play in the English language classroom. In this webinar, we will discuss the theories and practical strategies regarding the use of humor and language play in the English language classroom. Some educators may feel that humorous language is not a good way to teach language, but in this webinar, the presenters will explain how using humor and language play is a great tool for teaching your students pronunciation, grammar, and conversational language skills, all with a focus on vocabulary knowledge. You will see how examples of humor and language play work to enhance the learning of English and how these examples can be incorporated easily into your language learning curriculum. And it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today, Stephen Skulicki and David Chiesa. Stephen is a PhD student in the Department of Applied Linguistics at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. He earned his master's degree in rhetoric and composition from Washington State University. He has taught second language writing and TESOL courses in the US and abroad in China. His research interests focus on how creative types of language, such as humor and figurative language, are produced and comprehended by people in different situations with different backgrounds. And David is also a PhD student in applied linguistics at Georgia State University. He has been a teacher educator for the past 12 years in multiple countries throughout East Asia and the Pacific region, including Japan, China, Mongolia, and Thailand. Currently, he's working at his university's Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, implementing a new teacher education program for international teaching assistants. His research interests are in second language teacher cognition and development, language assessment, and second language acquisition. Welcome, Stephen and Dave. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Chiesa, and I want to thank Heather very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, Stephen and I are excited, really excited, to talk to all of you today about humor in the language classroom. Um, um, Stephen? Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, here with Dave. Really excited to start this. Um, as Heather said, we're both PhD students in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, um, in the Department of Applied Linguistics. And we're ready to talk about humor. And we think the best way is to start with a joke. Of course, let's do it. So, Dave, I have a question for you. Yeah, Stephen. <laughs> um, can you tell me, how does a farmer count a herd of cows? Hmm, how does a farmer count a herd of cows? How, Stephen? He uses a calculator. Ah! So, um, in case you didn't quite catch that, this is the joke I asked. How does a farmer count a herd of cows? The answer with a calculator. calculator. Get it? Cow sounds like the animal cow and cow. Okay, okay. So, Stephen and I really, really enjoy humor. We enjoy narratives, puns, uh, all different kinds of jokes, and we like to use humor in the language classroom. And so, today, we looked at some pre-webinar poll questions that we had for you. And the first one, do you consider yourself to be a funny teacher? And 78% of you said that you considered yourself to be a funny teacher. We, we both believe that you don't have to be funny to be a good teacher, but we're also really excited to see that a lot of you like to use humor in your classroom. Definitely. Um... The second question asked, can humor promote language learning? And almost everybody said yes, and we're really glad to see that result. Um, as the description of our webinar said, sometimes um, teachers might think that humor isn't a good way to, to teach language, but um, we would like to show that, in fact, it can be useful, and it's glad to see that all of you 
pretty much already tend to agree that it can be useful. Uh, the third question was, can beginner learners benefit from humor in the language classroom? And an overwhelmingly, all of you said, well, 98.7% believe that yes, beginning learners can benefit. And that makes me extremely happy because all levels can benefit. Definitely. Um, and finally, we asked, have you ever tried to use humor in your language classroom? This was also a pre-webinar um, discussion post on the Ning, and I saw many teachers provide uh, examples of specific humor topics that they used, and um, I've responded to not everyone, but, but a lot of people, and it uh, was really great to see a wide variety of types of humor that are used. And we'll talk more about some specific ones and, and how they can be used in the classroom. But um, we're really happy with the, uh, with the results so far. Yeah, definitely. So what are we going to do today? And so we, we will do three things today. First, we will define humor and language play. It's a very general topic, so we want to give you a little bit of focus. Second, we, we will describe theoretical reasons for using humor and play in the classroom. We believe that theory, research, and practice supports good teaching. And three, we will provide examples for implementing humor and play into the language classroom. So that's what we're going to do today. So let's begin. The question is, what is, what is humor? And Martin 2007 said that humor is a broad term that refers to anything that people say or do that is perceived as funny and tends to make others laugh, as well as the mental processes that go into both creating and perceiving such an amusing stimulus, and also the affective response involved in the enjoyment of it. This is a very big definition, so we decided to break it down. There are three aspects to humor. The first, it's the thing that is funny. In here, it could be a narrative, a joke, a pun, a riddle, anything. So it's a thing. Secondly, it's the person who creates the humor. And third, it's the responses hearers have, such as laughter, smiling, and more humor. And so humor is a very broad concept that has three aspects, the thing, the person, and the response. One, one thing we would like to ask is, what are some reasons why teachers might use humor in the language classroom? Please type in the chat box some responses that you believe. Whoa. This is great. This is great. Wow. <laughs> So we're seeing things like motivation, relax students, catch their attention, um, warm but, atmosphere, yep, breaking the ice, yep. Breaking the ice is a wonderful example. And if you don't know breaking the ice, you can go to the American English website and look at the YouTube videos on how to break the ice. Let's give you some reasons. Oh, also good atmosphere. Yeah, we believe in that too. Yeah, it can really help to um, relax students and make them less anxious or nervous. Uh, Kim in Korea said reducing stress. And I think that plays a large role, especially for, for us PhD students. We do use humor a lot to reduce stress. And also to connect with students and build rapport, which I think is another yeah. great example. And, and many of you brought that up on the forums um, that you can use humor as a teacher, um, not necessarily for teaching language, but for classroom purposes, such as uh, building relationships with your students and uh, easing their anxiety and things like that. Such as Camila from Chile said, lower anxiety. Okay, good. This is great. This is wonderful. 
let's give you some of our reasons for believing or the, on the functions of humor. For us, it does make students feel comfortable. Um, and many of you have also said that. Two, establishing and maintaining relationships, such as between teacher and student or between student and student. So humor can promote and establish relationships. Three, coping with difficult topics and situations. Sometimes there are social and political topics that can be very difficult, and humor can kind of break that tension. And then as many of you said, stress relief and relaxation. But one thing I don't want you to forget, it's fun. Humor is fun. It makes me laugh. It makes me smile. Great. Um, so good. Now we've talked about some ways that humor might work in the classroom or, or reasons why we want to use humor. Now we're going to talk about some types of humor and we're going to talk about three types specifically. We're going to talk about narratives, which are scripted stories that have a humorous ending. We're going to talk about puns, which is humor that uh, uses words with double meanings. And then we're also going to talk about riddles, which are humorous, linguistic, and cultural puzzles. I think I already know the answer to this question, but if can you raise your hand if you are familiar with any of these types of humor? And yeah. not surprisingly, yeah. everybody is raising their hand. This is great. This is great. So um, we'll go ahead and define them in a little bit more detail here, starting with narratives. So these are very short stories that will have a humorous ending. Uh, they're scripted and planned in advance. So they're not spontaneous humor, but they're a, a planned joke that you want to tell somebody, right? Um, and they typically end with what's called a punchline. And a punchline is that final phrase or sentence that causes the humor in a mm -hmm, joke. Mm -hmm. So we have an example here for you uh, of a narrative. So the narrative begins with this. A man walks into a library and says to the librarian, I'll have a cheeseburger and fries, please. The librarian responds, Sir, this is a library. The man then says, oh, I'm sorry. He then whispers, I'll have a cheeseburger and fries, please. Yeah. Okay. So um, <laughs> the, the humor in this, in this scripted narrative is caused by the man's misunderstanding of what the librarian meant, right? She was trying to tell him, you're in a library, you can't order food here. <laughs> but the man interpreted that as, I'm in a library, I need to be quiet. Okay, so that's, that's essentially what narratives are, and I think we all know uh, quite a few of these. Let's also talk about puns. Um, if you did the pre-webinar reading that was posted on the uh, website, there was one article by Lems about puns in wordplay, and so you may be familiar. But in general, puns are a special form of humor based on double meanings. So it's important to emphasize that every pun will have two meanings that coexist or occur at the same time. Um, these two meanings are signaled by words that will sound very similar, sound the same, or look the same. So let's talk about these in detail by giving you some examples of puns. Here is the first one. A skunk fell in a river and stank to the bottom. In case you don't know, here's a skunk. <laughs> uh, these are animals that typically are known to spray a very bad smelling scent. Uh, so they stink, they're very stinky. So the pun here, uh, the two meanings of this pun are based on the stinkiness of the skunk, hence the word stank, but also the fact that the pun is in, or the skunk is in water and sinking. So what we have here is the word stank also sounds like the word sank. All right, so we have two meanings, the stinkiness of the skunk and the fact that it was sinking to the bottom of the water. Okay, next one. Dave. Yeah. What kind of flower grows on your face? What kind of flower grows on your face? Mm. Two, 
Tulips. Tulips? Tulips. Ah, that's a great answer. Tulips. Okay. So, this is a pun that is playing on the idea of flowers and something that can grow in your face. Now, tulips are a type of flower, right? So that is a possible answer to this question. Tulips are a type of flower. Hmm. But what do tulips sound like that could also have to do with your face? And some of you are writing it in the chat box. Uh, but right, the word tulips can also sound like two lips, right? So everybody's face typically has two lips on it. So the double meaning here, again, is the flower that are called tulips and then the actual phrase two lips. Okay, got it? <laughs> and then we finally we have uh, hey, Dave. Yeah, Stephen. Can you tell me what kind of bird is found at a construction site? What kind of bird is found at a construction site? I don't know. You don't know? I don't I, know. I've got an answer for you. It's a crane. Ah! ah! ah some of you in the <laughs> chat got it too. Good, good, good. Okay, so this is a word. Crane, as it is spelled, can mean more than one thing, right? So at a construction site, a crane is a big truck or piece of machinery that lifts heavy objects. But a crane is also a type of bird, right? So these are, this sentence uh, allows for the, both meanings to occur at the same time, and this is typically where the humor comes from. Okay, so those are puns. And we'll show you some activities that can help uh, students understand these puns and use them in the classroom in a little bit. So next we have riddles. Uh, we define riddles as cultural and linguistic puzzles. Uh, typically, the answer to a riddle is funny uh, because it is usually unexpected. Uh, it requires seeing something differently, and it also may involve using words differently. So, let's, let's give some examples. Uh, Dave. Yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah. What is something that is brown and <laughs> sticky? Um, I, I don't know. Oh, you don't know something that's brown and sticky? <laughs> no. I see somebody said brown rice, glue. <laughs> well, everybody, the answer is a stick. Ah! Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, a stick. So this is a riddle because brown and sticky are typically adjectives, and people are saying glue and chocolate. That Yes, those are all things that can be brown and sticky, but... We're changing the meaning of sticky to, to essentially mean something that is like a stick. So it's sticky or stick-like, right? Okay, so <laughs> that's an unexpected answer, right? Um, we got one more here. So, Dave, yeah. I, have, I have another riddle. Okay. What has a face, two hands, mm. but no arms or legs? Face, two hands... No arms or legs. I got it! I got it! I got it! I got it! You got it? A clock! I think you just read that from the people in the chat. Oh, that's no. correct. <laughs> a <laughs> clock. <laughs> or a watch, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so, again, we have uh, people, we, we have this riddle playing with face, hands, arms, legs. You, you think, oh, what kind of animal or, or person, you know, qualifies as that? But really, it's clock, right? Because clocks have faces, right, Dave? Yep. That's and they true. also have. Two hands, a big hand and a little hand. Aww. Okay. Yes, I got it. So these are these <laughs> these are riddles. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is word play, and we've also used the term language play um, in the title and in the webinar. And I just want to clarify that word play and language play we're talking about the same thing. So word play is a concept that essentially means uh, people are playing with the form or meaning of words and phrases. They can play with it either through uh, form uh, of the written appearance or through the sound. Okay? Uh, they also play with meaning in terms of it being either ambiguous or multiple meanings. So, what we want to point out is that all of the examples of jokes that we just showed you involve wordplay. And wordplay can promote uh, language learning 
and knowledge through the just manipulation of different forms of language. Um, just to summarize, narratives used wordplay. Uh, it played with meaning of this is a library. What mm. did what did the librarian mean, right? Uh, puns definitely use wordplay with forms and sounds, right? Two lips and two lips. And then finally, riddles play with meaning and form, really sticky like a stick. Okay, so we've defined three types of jokes, and we've talked about how they all essentially use this thing called wordplay or language play. So we have a quick poll for you now to see if you uh, can guess what type of joke this is or, or, or figure out what this joke is. It's, uh, the joke is... Did you hear the story about the skunk? Never mind. It stinks. So do you think that's a pun, a riddle, or a narrative? And a lot of people are coming in with puns. puns. Yep. Uh, not many people with riddle. A couple people think it's a narrative. We'll give it a couple more seconds here. But I think the results are in saying it's a pun. Mm. Now, that definitely makes sense because of the word stinks at the end, mm -hmm. right? So remember, skunks are animals that are stinky. Um, but we can also say that something stinks in terms of it being bad. Like that joke wasn't funny. That story wasn't <laughs> funny. That story stinks, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely a double <clears throat> meaning going on here. If you said riddle, um, it also is a riddle in a way that you get sort of an unexpected answer. And so we have kind of two things going on. And really, you could even say it's a narrative because it's a scripted joke. So the important thing to realize is that really it's, it's wordplay, it's language play serving a humorous end. And good job, okay. So let's move on to the next part here for Dave. Great, thank you. So what we've talked about so far is what is humor? And we mentioned that humor is a thing, the person, and the response. And the thing is a thing that Stephen just discussed. Narratives, puns, and riddles. These are really good to use in the language classroom. The question is, how does language learning actually happen? Now we're going to focus more on theory and how theory and humor relate. Social cultural theory, that's where we're going to begin, and then we'll talk about negotiation for meaning. There's a man named Lev Vygotsky. Please raise your hand if you have heard of Vygotsky. Okay, so, whoa, many of you have. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Wonderful. Great. So, for those of you who do not know, Vygotsky... Uh, researched and looked at children and how children interacted, um, sometimes on the playground, sometimes on the street with friends. And what he found was that social activity pushes development. So children learn by interacting with each other. And their social activity pushes their development. And so we take Vygotsky's idea of social cultural theory as a means of understanding how humor works. So if social activity pushes development, then we must think about how are the different types of people interacting with. First, he believes that someone more capable can help someone less capable. Also, someone equally as capable can help push social development, such as a friend. Someone less capable can help someone learn as well. So when I was living in China, I remember all the time I'd be talking to little children and my Chinese was so bad. But when I interacted with the children, they kind of taught me. They're less capable, but they helped me with my tones and my pronunciation, and they looked at me funny a lot. <laughs> the different type is also yourself. And so, Vygotsky saw that you can learn from someone more capable, like a teacher, someone equally as capable, like a friend, 
someone less capable, like a young child, for example, helping me, and also myself. And he talked about scaffolding. And so it is through all of these forms of interaction that learning can happen. And so what he said was, play leads to development. Stephen mentioned puns, riddles, narratives. This kind of play in interaction can lead to development. So Vygotsky said, quote, in play, a child always behaves beyond his average age. Above his daily behavior, in play, it is as though he were a head taller than himself. What he means is, or in other words, playing allows people to engage in difficult learning tasks. And so humor and play is an affordance or possible use. Humor allows for learning in certain situations. An affordance or possible use. I like to think of it like a leaf. So a leaf offers different uses or affordances to different organisms. For example, a tree frog can crawl on the leaf. An ant can cut it a caterpillar for food, a spider for shade, and a shaman for medicine, and so on and so on. And so, humor is like an affordance. It is the leaf. The humor does not change, but how each person uses it and reacts to it in interaction can vary. And so learning happens by children interacting and everyone interacting and using humor for their own purposes Ooh, that's a little heavy isn't it Stephen? yep yep so um we're talking a lot about interaction um and we want to make connections between humor play and second language learning um alongside sociocultural theory there's another theory called the interaction theory that has long stated language learning occurs when learners are interacting in meaningful conversation. Um, this is because they negotiate meaning with each other during periods of time when they are working to be understood or working to understand. Okay, In order to be understood or to understand, speakers and hearers must work to modify their language. In other words, they must change what was said in order to help understanding, right? Uh, we have two examples here. So let's, let's think of a situation where a learner cannot understand. I will pretend Dave is a learner. Okay. So I say, excuse me, Dave, <laughs> but are you free right now? Am I free? Well, what does that mean? Ah, so clearly some sort of misunderstanding has gone on here. So I change what I said to say, Dave, are you busy right now? Ah, uh, oh no, I'm not busy. Right, so the modification of my language has helped Dave understand me, right? Uh, alongside of that is times when the learner cannot be understood. Uh, Dave is still the learner and he says to me, I do want food for eating. And I say, what are you saying? Uh, I am hungry. Aha! Oh, well, let's, let's go eat then, if you're hungry. So, the learner in this situation had to change his output to be understood. So, humor and L2 learning um, can encourage interaction and social activity. It helps, interact, it helps people interact with different capabilities, uh, which, as you can see through the modification of language, helps people understand each other. Um, it makes students more comfortable, or it can make students more comfortable. Um, it also prompts negotiation. I had to explain many of those jokes, right? So there may be some misunderstanding with humor, but when you go through the process of explaining a joke, you are negotiating meaning, right? It makes a conversation more realistic. Um, explaining and understanding humor helps negotiate the meaning. 
and it allows for learners to consider different forms and meanings of words. And so a question we have for you is, what are some possible challenges when using humor in the classroom? Please take 10 seconds and respond in the chat box. Jokes falling flat. Jokes falling flat. Culture, yeah. Culture, big. Shyness. Uh, Sujatha said jokes falling flat, yeah. Malay uh, flat Leela from Malaysia says it allows learners to consider the words. Exactly. So there are many possible challenges. Uh, some that we thought of, first of all, humor can be too personal. Um, two, humor might or could offend someone. Uh, we have to be very careful in how we use humor. Three, humor can, is not seen as a serious language. And four, humor requires cultural knowledge, as many of you, many of you have said. And finally, humor can be seen as only for advanced learners, but we know from the pre-webinar poll that all of you believe that beginning learners can also uh, use humor. And so to address these challenges, we want to see how humor fits into the language classroom. So we look at how to address the challenge. How does humor fit in? Humor does not have to be the goal of the course, and this is the key feature we want to address. We use humor to help meet the goals of your course. And so we think of backwards design. Backwards design is a very wonderful concept in how we create a course or a lesson plan, for example. There are three questions we think about. Where do you want to go? How do you get there? And how do you know you're there? I think of these questions every time I create a lesson plan. Where do I want to go with the class? Meaning, what's my final goal? What is each step of, on how I get there? And then how do I know I'm there? Keep these three questions in mind. And so, for example, beginning learners. If the end goal is, learners will be able to exchange greetings and introduce themselves to others. We think of how does humor help with this end goal? Humor can be an effective icebreaker. It can help make initial introductions and make you feel more comfortable. Give students something to use outside the class as well. And so, it is humor helps with the goals of the course, it is not the ultimate destination. And so we think of four ways of using humor in the language classroom. The first is teaching them how to identify humor. The second is comprehending humor. So comprehension also involves identification. Three, producing humor. And four, responding to humor. One, two, three, and four. Fourth is the highest level of using humor. Let's begin with how do we teach our students to identify humor? Well, the purpose is to build students' ability to recognize humor. That's the main purpose, to identify it. And this may, the student may not understand the humor. Remember, is to recognize it. How do we do that in the classroom? We can analyze scripted examples of humor, and we can ask students, how is humor being signaled in this example? And so, I love knock-knock jokes. Raise your hand if you know what a knock-knock joke is. Looks like a lot of people are familiar with knock-knock jokes. That's good. Very good. Let's talk about knock-knock jokes. Do you know where they come from? Knock-knock jokes actually came or originated in the 1920s during the period of American history called Prohibition. Prohibition is when alcohol was not allowed. And so people had to go to what's called a speakeasy. 
These are secret places where they can drink alcohol. And so, patrons had to have a code to get in. What was the code? You can guess it. It's often they would go to the door and knock twice, like this. Knock, knock. And then the operator would ask, who's there? And then, of course, it's history. So once again, the knock-knock joke is, knock-knock, who's there? And then something. And so, knock-knock jokes have a structure. It's a very thick structure that can help young learners use humor. It begins, knock-knock, who's there? Some noun, noun who? And then the punchline. If you don't remember, a punchline is the final phrase or sentence that causes the humor. And so, the knock-knock joke is good for younger and less proficient learners. Let's give you some examples of some knock-knock jokes. Example number one. Knock-knock. Who's there? Cow says. Cow says who? No, silly. Cow says moo. <laughs> this is funny because cows don't say who. Their sound is more <laughs> And so it's a play on the sound. Another, I love that joke. Another example is knock knock. Who's there? Boo! Boo hoo! Don't cry, it's just me. And so here, boo hoo is a sound a child, a baby could make, like <laughs> boo hoo hoo hoo. And so it's a play on the sound boo hoo. So when learners hear knock knock, they know to expect something humorous. And so this fixed structure is good for beginning learners. What's also really interesting about knock-knock jokes is that they can build upon each other. So, for example, knock-knock, who's there? Knows. Knows who? I know is another knock-knock joke. And so, here, it's I know another knock-knock joke. Sounds like knows. Second one, knock-knock, who's there? Ears? Ears who? Here's another knock-knock joke. So, I know another knock-knock joke. I hear another knock-knock joke. And last one, knock-knock. Who's there? Chin? Chin who? Chin up. I'm not going to tell you any more knock-knock jokes, even though I will after. <laughs> and so, chin up is an idiom. It's a set expression, right? And it means, like, it's okay. You can do it. And so, knock-knock jokes can be used by teachers as transitions between stories, activities, or tasks. Um, also, shared humor uh, between, between people, such as building rapport, anticipating fun, and also capturing attention. These are great ways that not, you can use humor and knock-knock jokes to identify humor in the language classroom. Great. Um, before we move on, I just want to poke, point out some people are mentioning in the chat, oh, we need to teach learners vocabulary and concepts like that. And that's exactly the point, is, is using humor allows for the opportunity to teach new words and meanings in a way that will be more memorable for the students. So after the identification of humor, uh, comprehending or understanding humor is the next step. And this means we want students to be able to identify and understand examples of humor. How do we do that? Well, the teacher's role will be to provide that background knowledge, such as vocabulary knowledge and perhaps even cultural knowledge necessary to understand the examples of humor. And then the teacher prompts students to consider meanings of certain words or phrases and how they may be triggering the humor. And one way to do this that works well uh, was in the pre-webinar reading, uh, the pun comprehension activity from the LEMS article works very well. Um, the basic steps for this activity are to teach learners those three different types of puns that we talked about, right? The puns that sound very similar, the puns that sound the same, and the puns that look the same. So you teach learners these categories, 
give them lots of examples. Then you just give students more examples and ask them to identify the pun types. You may need to highlight keywords, um, but you ask students to explain what is causing humor in the pun. Right? So, in other words, you ask students to explain the double meaning of the pun. So, what that might look like is you could give students a worksheet that looks something like this. You have puns on the left side with the key words highlighted that you want students to focus on. Uh, then you ask them to just circle which pun type these puns are. So a student may sit down and look at this and say, oh, here's what I think these puns are. And they would be right. Uh, you can see the calculator pun from that we opened the webinar with down there is a sounds very similar pun. Uh, the charging bull pun was actually brought up on the discussion board beforehand and charging can mean either running or putting charges on a credit card <laughs> to spend money on a credit card. And then the middle pun is playing with the way that the word write as in correct and write as in to write something sounds the same. Okay. The next step is to ask students to explain that by having them fill in the different meanings that are going on in these puns. And students may not be able to get all of the meanings, but maybe they can understand one of them and then can talk to other students or talk to the teacher or have a large group discussion to try to figure out the different meanings. So here students are considering vocabulary knowledge and how sentence context is leading to different interpretations of words. We have a quick question for you. Um, we want to know what language skills do you think are being used in this activity? By language skills we mean things like speaking, reading, right, yeah. So we see speaking, listening, reading, Critical thinking, yeah. Pronunciation, reading, all of them. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> I like that answer, all of them. That's what we think too. Um, depending on how you employ this activity in your classroom, if it's a speaking activity or mainly a writing activity, you can key in to almost all of the big language skills. And that's the point we wanted to try to make. Okay, so let's say we want to talk about comprehending humor. And let's say that you teach cooperative learning in your classroom. You have group work, for example. You want to use all language skills. What can you do? What kind of activity can you implement? Today, I'm going to tell you my secret activity, which is my favorite activity to do for anything. You can adapt this activity for anything. I'm giving you my secret. It's called wake up and go to sleep. Wake up, your eyes are open. Like the woman on the left, she's like, yes, good morning. And the guy on the right, go to sleep. Your eyes are closed. So wake up, eyes are open, go to sleep, eyes are closed. This is how the basis of the activity goes. Let me explain step by step. Step one, if you have many groups in your class, for example, group one has four students, student one, two, three, and four. All the students go to sleep. The teachers, the teachers in the front of the room or wherever the teacher needs to be. So all students start asleep. They are closing their eyes with their heads down. Then the second step. The teacher tells student one to wake up. That student looks and memorizes a word the teacher is showing. A word, a phrase, a clause, any language. Step three. The teacher tells student one to go back to sleep. So that student one has something memorized. Then step four, the teacher repeats steps one through three with each student using a new word each time. Finally, all students wake up and form a sentence with their memorized words. It's kind of like a jigsaw. And here is an example. I will say as a teacher, everyone go to sleep. Everyone goes to sleep. Then I will say, student one, wake up. Student one sees Dave and Steven. Student one memorizes these three words and then goes back to sleep. 
Student two, wake up. Memorize the word. Go back to sleep. Student three, wake up. Memorize. Go back to sleep. Student four, wake up. <laughs> go back. Memorize. Go back to sleep. And then everyone wakes up. I then say, make the sentence. And the sentence is, Dave and Steven are the best teachers. Yes! <laughs> they were good friends too. And so that's how the activity goes. And so, yippee, let's say that you want to use riddles in your class. And let's go back to what a riddle is. Riddles are many stories that are, they, many stories are built around riddles. And so riddles have been used to educate, to test problem solving skills and provoke discussion. But we want you to choose riddles very carefully. They can be good lead-ins and can serve as comprehension questions about a story. And so, how can we use wake up and go to sleep activity and riddles together? Here's an example. Let's say you just teach a fairy tale. Now, a fairy tale is a cultural story with lessons. For example, the three little pigs. You know, three little pigs. Three pigs each build a house. One is made of brick, one is made of stick, and one is made of straw. A wolf tries to blow down all their houses. So a wolf comes and blows the straw house down, blows the stick house down, but he can't blow down the brick house. So what did we learn from this story? That only the pig who spent time using brick keeps his house. So we teach a story. Now we want to check their comprehension to see if they get it and we're going to, we're going to use humor. So. The question I have for my students is, what did the first little pig say after the wolf blew down his house? Here we have a riddle. I will now use wake up and go to sleep activity to teach this. Student one, wake up. Memorize. Go to sleep. Student two, wake up. Memorize. Go to sleep. Student three, wake up. Memorize. Go to sleep. Student four, wake up. Memorize. Go to sleep. And now, everyone wake up. Put the sentence together. What do you have? We have the answer. That's the last straw. Bah! Steven, explain the humor in this. Well, it's <laughs> another example of wordplay. Uh, the last straw literally means the last piece of straw of his house. But the last straw is also uh, an English idiom that means like, this is the final thing. This is the last point, right? This is it. Okay, so that's, that's the example of, of using that. We also want to talk about producing humor, which would be the next logical step. We have students able to identify and comprehend. Now can we have them produce humor? And that sounds really difficult, right? But we want to develop that ability because uh, it's going to lead to more language skills and knowledge, right? Um, it will also grow different ways of using the second language. How do we do this? Well, we don't just say, make a joke. We can provide students with topics or frames. Um, one way is to teach students narratives. Remember, you can memorize a narrative and students can then go out and tell that joke. That's one way, but something a little more creative uh, can be a completion activity that you do in class. Um, again, I like to use puns. And so we give students puns that are missing a single word, the key word, right, that causes the humor. Students are then given several options to complete that pun. Uh, they basically choose which word uh, used to complete the pun. So we want to try that out with you real quick by giving you um, a sample joke to see if you can figure out which one to put in. So we'll wait for it to... Okay, so here's your joke. What's black and white and blank all over? The answer is a newspaper. What word can we choose that makes this humorous? And I see a lot of people are choosing Number one, red. 
Some people are choosing seen. Some people are choosing carried. Well, the typical answer here would be number one, red, because the word red sounds like a color, but can also be a verb, and this makes sense with the answer being newspaper. It's black and white, but also red. Okay, good job. So that's exactly what you would ask your students to do. Um, and you can give them a worksheet that looks like this. You have a frame and three or four options. Oh, what happened there? Yeah, and you have several options for them to choose from, right? Not sure why that keeps going back. Okay, um, so in the first one, uh, we, we have one blank, and in the second and third option, they have two blanks. And students can figure out some of the words based on sentence clues, um, but they may also be able to guess them based on the humor. So students might choose these as the answers, and we would say, good job, you have chosen yes. the words that make humor. Um, we can explain these in more detail on the forms, but essentially, uh, students are choosing the words that uh, provide a double meaning. King is related to ruler, student and clock is related to time, and word and spelled is related to dictionary, right? Okay, we have another uh, way to have students produce humor. Here. Remember knock-knock jokes? Well, once again, well, we first talked about knock-knock jokes with identifying humor, but now they can actually produce their own knock-knock jokes. Uh, we first provide students with examples of knock-knock jokes, as we have done before, and then two, we provide them empty frames of knock-knock jokes where they can put in their own. Uh, and then finally, students work in pairs to think of nouns, plus who that will create a funny knock-knock joke. And then finally, students tell their knock-knock jokes to each other. So, this is what this is what the worksheet would look like. And then students can see the instructions, they can see the empty frames, and then the third step, we will ask them to share their knock-knock jokes. Yeah, um, so that those are two examples to have students produce humor. Now, the final step was responding to humor, and this is easily the most difficult step because you want learners to react to humor in pragmatically appropriate ways, right? And you can do this by providing situations for learners to safely engage in humorous discussion. It does require the three previous skills we've talked about. Um, we don't have any examples here during the webinar for the sake of time, but do check out the Ning where we will post a worksheet or two uh, that has a sample activity for this. Now, the last thing we want to just cover is that we stress that the point of the class doesn't need to be about humor, but it could be. And we have just one idea. If you're teaching a business English class, uh, businesses typically use puns in advertisements to attract customers. So you could have a unit based on humor in advertising and ask students to go find examples of puns in advertising and then maybe create some for advertising. So they're learning about business English and humor at the same time um, with a focus on both topics. So thank you very much, Stephen. And so let's quickly talk about what we talked about today. First, we define humor and language play. Humor is a very broad topic that is the thing, the person who uses the humor, and the response. Then we describe theoretical reasons for using humor and play in the classroom, particularly social cultural theory and negotiation for meaning. These two theoretical frameworks help us or let us mm, prove that using humor can help learning, not just for fun, but I like fun, but helping for learning. And three, we provided some examples for implementing humor and play into the classroom, such as identifying humor using knock-knock jokes, comprehending humor, producing humor, and responding to humor. So, well, yeah, we just want to say thank you and remind you that the conversation isn't over. Um, there already is another conversation going on on the Ning. We really encourage you to go there and post your questions that you have or your examples of humorous activities that you use in the class. So thank you, everybody, so much for your Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.
so much, Stephen and Dave. I also want to say a big thank you to you, our audience, for your active participation today, and we look forward to learning with you during future webinars during Series 4.